little bit intimidating, but um, I'm not going to tell you my age, but when I sat down there, I realized that this pulpit was made the same year I was born. <laughs> and it's got a lot of... Uh, it still looks good. <laughs> so if you want to know my age, you can come up and look at it. a blessing being here. Uh, I told Deanna last night, I said, hey, you know, if only 10 or 15 ladies show up, I'm fine with that. Because in my church in Spain, that's about the amount of ladies that usually come to our ladies meeting every month. So, uh, so I'm fine. I'm, I'm more used to speaking to smaller groups and I'm more used to talking in Spanish. So this will be a, a challenge. <laughs> And today, in Spain, they're having a, a regional ladies meeting, and 10 of the ladies from our church went. There's usually about 150 ladies from about 10 Baptist churches in the Madrid area, and uh, so they, they went to that today, and of course, they're almost finished with it because it's, they're six hours ahead of us. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. No, you know, I'm sorry. I'm not used to talking in larger rooms either. Our whole church building is probably about this size. <laughs> uh, I'll try to speak as loud as possible so that you can hear me. Um, the theme, the, the, the name of the class that I'm supposed to teach today is From Weakness to Strength and Emphasizing Humility. Um, it is a theme that is so important to all of us in our churches today as a Christian uh, what we, the way we live, there is so much pride in the world. Uh, we see it in politics. Nowadays, there is so much pride. Even when people know the truth, they still insist on what they want. And uh, there's pride. There's pride in churches, uh, in ladies' groups. Uh, I have noticed through the years I've been in with my husband as a missionary for almost 40 years now, and one of the biggest problems in churches that we've been involved with is pride. Pride can destroy a church and it destroys people. Uh, when we think of humility, humility is the quality of having a modest or low view of one's importance. Uh, true humility comes when we have a correct view of ourselves. And it is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. And we, we're always thinking of ourselves. No, we, we want to be happy. We want to, we want to have all our needs met, like uh, April spoke about last night. But we need to think of ourselves less. And the feminist movement is very strong in all the world. In Spain, it is terrible. Uh, there is so much uh, hatred in the hearts of women nowadays. Uh, I understand years ago uh, there was a lot of uh, women were restricted in a lot of areas, not allowed to vote, not allowed to ever speak or anything. And I, and I understand that frustration. But now women, that's not their agenda now. Uh, the feminist movement is based on pride. Compare the feminist agenda with Proverbs 31 and the, the virtuous woman, and it's completely different. Uh, the feminists don't just want equality with men. They want to put men down and have women <coughs> to be superior and rule over men. That's what they want. They don't want to be mothers. They don't want to raise children and be loving, kind, submissive wives. They want to rule. And therefore, it has made men become weak, become very, uh, they, they just don't know how to be leaders anymore because the women have pushed them down so much. Uh, sad to say this movement has <coughs> invaded the church. And we noticed that a lot. I, at the beginning, when we first started the church that we're in right now in Spain, uh, a lot of the new women that came in just kept on saying, but why can't women preach? And why can't we do this? And why can't we do that? And of course, we always pointed to the scripture because God has established the role of women and the role of men. And uh, But it's very difficult because women, especially 
the, the younger generation have been brainwashed into thinking that women need to be <coughs> superior. And for God, we're all the same. Mm -hmm. And he has a job for each one of us to do, and we should be happy with the job that God has given us to do. Uh, I love being a woman. I love being a mother, a grandmother, mm -hmm. a wife. Uh, I love being with women and teaching them the word of God. And that's such a high position in God's uh, view. Um, what should be the correct view of ourselves as Christian women? We're servants. Not just women, but men also. We are servants. Servants serve. Okay? Uh, servants obey. And servants don't expect praise or thanks for what they do. Servants belong to their masters. In Luke 17, if you have your Bibles, if you can look in the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, Verses 7 through 10. These verses say, But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve meat? till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? <clears throat> I trow not. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Uh, we are servants. So when we serve the Lord, when we serve our families, when we do those things, we shouldn't be sitting around waiting for somebody to come thank us. Pat us on the back. We should say, I am an unprofitable servant. I will do what I know is right to do, and I won't expect any praise from it. If somebody does thank you, just praise the Lord for that. But we are unprofitable servants. Uh, we have been bought with a price. Servants, like during the time of slaves here in the United States, uh, these slaves were bought by landowners, by rich people. They would come and they'd look and see whether they were strong enough and healthy enough to work in their field. And so they would buy them with money. But we have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Christ. Amen. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, uh, well, I'll just look at this real quick. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. When we realize that Christ died on the cross and shed his precious blood to purchase us, to purchase our salvation, to purchase our forgiveness, wow, all we can do is say, Lord, I am your servant for now and for all eternity. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher in London, once wrote, the ever-living died to redeem us. The only begotten bowed his head in agony and was laid in the grave that we might be saved. We are bought then with a price, a price incalculable, stupendous, infinite. Once we realize we're servants of Christ, we then have the correct view of who we are and then we have true humility. At that point, we stop demanding God to do things for us because does a servant do that? <laughs> no, he, you know, he just mm, can't say anything. You just serve. You just do exactly what uh, what your master tells you to do. Um, many 
times we all fall into this trap. We're all like this. God, you know I love you, and I faithfully serve you. Uh, I read your word every day. I pray. I attend my <coughs> church every time the door is open. I give my offerings. I pass out tracts. I witness to my friends. Why haven't you answered my prayer <laughs> and given me a husband, a better job, a better car, a bigger house, health, etc.? That's what we do. It's like a bargaining chip. If I do all of this, then you're going to bless me and give me all of this. And that's not the way we should be as servants. We should say, thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for me because I don't deserve any of it. And and I what, what April said last night in the class is so true. We as Americans feel like this is our, uh, what, what do you call it? Our, um, our right. Our right. Our right. <coughs> and yet when we travel overseas, I mean, I've lived in, in three different countries besides the United States, some very poor where we live. And you see how much we have as Americans, mm -hmm. how blessed we are, mm -hmm. but it's not our right. Uh, what we deserve is hell, mm -hmm. but Jesus bought us. Um, in 2 Corinthians, and this is the main uh, scripture that we're gonna read, in 2 Corinthians 12, from seven to 10, very familiar passage that will be <coughs> Second Corinthians 12 7 through 10 the Apostle Paul is speaking here and he says unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul learned true humility. Mm -hmm. uh, he learned it from weakness in his own life and leaning on God's strength. Uh, what weaknesses was Paul talking about in these verses? Like in verse 10, he says, infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses. Uh, these weaknesses were not, uh, uh, not with, they were not, uh, what would you call it, uh, fleshly weaknesses. It wasn't a weakness of sin, like I'm weak because I have these sinful thoughts or because I just, this temptation is very strong to do something wrong. That's not what the weaknesses that he was talking about here. They were not these fleshly weaknesses. He was speaking about his sins and his weakness when temptations come. Okay? He is talking about, I don't know, he's not talking about his sins. He, uh, he is talking about other things. Okay? He's talking about sicknesses, and many of us have had sicknesses. Uh, circumstances and situations that are very difficult for us, persecutions from people who ridicule our faith uh, or have prejudices against us, calamities that crush us or weigh us down. All of these things make us look weak. Uh, how do you feel when you're sick? Like you got a cold, you got the flu. Your nose is bright red, your eyes are watering, your hair is all a mess because you're laying in bed, and you're laying there, and your husband comes in and looks at you from afar, and, and you're laying there and you say, oh, I hate feeling like this. I 
I want to get up. I want to just be normal again. I don't want to show him my weakness. My, ugh, I just feel terrible. I, I know as I've, I've heard people talk about when they're going through chemo, when they've had cancer, and how they go to the hospital and they're laying there getting all of that chemo, and it just it makes them feel so weak. Uh, they, they don't like that. Mm. I was with my parents last week in Chattanooga uh, visiting them. My dad is 94, mm. and he still doesn't think he's old. <laughs> and uh, he, the doctor tells him, because he's fallen several times, and the doctor says, you have to use a cane. Mm. Uh, but, and he's, he doesn't hear very well, so we're having to talk very loud. He says, why don't you get some hearing aid? He says, I can hear perfectly well. <laughs> and he doesn't, he said, I don't want anybody to think I'm old. <laughs> and, and I look at it because we, we feel vulnerable. We lose our, our ability to be that strong leader, you know? And my dad was always a very strong man, and now he's weak. And it's hard for him. And, and I know it's the same with all of us. We, in Spain, we ride public transportation a lot. When I get on the train, I walk in there and I'm holding on to the, the pole and we move around and all of a sudden this young person says, come sit down. I'm <laughs> <laughs> quite fine here. <laughs> we don't want to feel weak. We want to be up and in our car and driving and going to the store and showing everybody how strong we are. But there is so much as a Christian that we learn through weakness. And God wants us to go through those times of weaknesses to make us strong. Um, if we were strong enough, we would work harder to get out of financial stresses. You know, sometimes you're, you're working, you're doing <coughs> things, and yet the bills come and, and you can't seem to get out of debt and you're having a hard time financially. If we were super heroes, we would be able to work three and four jobs and get out of debt and have lots of money if we were strong enough. Uh, if we were strong enough, we would give insults back to people who ridicule our faith. We would, every time they ridiculed us, we would just fire back with our, with our uh, responses. Uh, if we would find solutions to our health problems if we were strong enough. I'm gonna find a cure for cancer. I'm gonna find a cure for this disease or the other. But we don't have that kind of strength. And Paul thought he was strong. He had seen God work in so many ways in his life. Uh, ooh, he survived shipwreck and, and uh, beatings and all kinds of things and he kept on going. He was a strong person. He had even been taken up to the third heaven and had seen things that no man has ever seen. He felt he was strong. But it would have been easy for him to be puffed up with pride, and that's the problem. When we, are, when we feel strong in ourselves, we get puffed up with pride. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could have boast about all those things that had happened to him. In verse 7, it says, And lest I should be exalted above measure mm -hmm. through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, it says that that thorn in the flesh mm -hmm. was a messenger from Satan mm -hmm. to buffet him. So we think all the bad things that happen in our life come from the devil. Mm -hmm. That's what we think. So these weaknesses are from Satan. I see God allows Satan to do certain things in our lives. Uh, but, he, but he wants to make us, the devil wants to make us miserable, and he wants to destroy us. But these weaknesses also came from God. Because later on it says he, he asked the Lord to take these thing, this thorn away from him. And God said no. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Um, God allowed this affliction to humble Paul, to get rid of his pride, 
Satan tries to destroy us, but God uses it to help us grow in humility. We know this came from God because in verse 8, Paul asked God three times to remove it from him, but God answered no, because God's strength is made perfect in weakness. What is the purpose of these weaknesses? <clears throat> Why do we have hardships, persecutions, troubles? Why can't I find a job? Why am I sick? Why does my dad have cancer? Why can't I have children? Why hasn't God given me a husband yet? We don't know what Paul's thorn was exactly. Some people have said it was a physical ailment, maybe a, a sickness in the eye. Many others believe it was a, a satanic attack in the form of false teachers trying to destroy <coughs> the ministry in Corinth. Whatever it was, God did not remove it. He gave Paul his grace to be able to keep on going in spite of the opposition. <clears throat> Satan wanted to harass Paul, but God wanted to humble Paul. When everything goes great in our lives, we, we tend to become proud. Mm -hmm. Look at all that I have. Mm -hmm. Look at my beautiful family. Look at my fancy car. Look at my great ministry. Look at my important job. Look at my position in the church. But God's purpose in our humility is, is our humility and to glorify his son, Jesus everything in our lives should be to glorify the Lord. Mm -hmm. there, if God gives us great things, if God gives you a, a big, beautiful home or a nice car or a great job or good ministries, just praise him for that mm -hmm. and use those things that he's given you mm -hmm. to glorify God, mm -hmm. to be used more in the ministry. Uh, God shows Paul the weaker the human vessel with more clarity shines the grace of God in the midst of adversity. Paul became stronger in his walk with God in the midst of weakness. Uh, I know, I'm sure many of you have heard of Joni Erickson Tata. Mm -hmm. She's been around a long time. Uh, when writing about her diving accident, she said, I was a Christian back then but life in Christ didn't define who I was. True, I understood I was a new creation with a new heart, at least in theory, but I didn't live like it. So after my accident, I dug into my Bible for help, hoping that Jesus would give me back all that I'd lost. I wanted, I needed my body back. After many years, she wrote, a no answer to my request for a miraculous physical healing has meant purged sin, a love for the lost, increased compassion, stretched hope, an appetite for grace, an increase of faith, a happy longing for heaven, a desire to serve, a delight in prayer, and a hunger for his word. Mm -hmm. And then she ends up by saying, Oh, bless the stern schoolmaster that is my wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. How many of us, when we go through adversity, actually come out with those thoughts? Mm -hmm. God teaches all of us. It doesn't matter who we are. Each one of us is going to go through difficulties in our lives. We're all going to have those thorns in our flesh, those thorns that the Satan uses to try to destroy us. And you will either be destroyed or you will come out uh, stronger and better able to serve God with your life. So when we are tempted to be puffed up with pride, when we think we have the perfect life, the perfect marriage, the perfect children, I've never seen any yet, <laughs> the perfect job, and we think we are so important in our church, in the ministry we work in. Remember that God wants us to be humble, to find our strength in God and not in ourselves. Uh, there is a verse in Micah, smack in the, yes, that is in the Bible, <laughs> the book of Micah, Chapter 6, <clears throat> Micah 
chapter six, uh, at the beginning of this chapter, uh, the the Israel obviously has been sinning. All of the minor and major prophets are talking about the the uh, punishment that God inflicts on on his people because they are rebellious against him. And and then Israel is like, well, what can we do? Do you want more sacrifices? Uh, do you want us to sacrifice our children? I mean, they did some terrible things back then. And each one in their pious mind, they were thinking that they were going to uh, be able to please God with those sacrifices. Look at all I've done. Look at all we've done. Why aren't you blessing us? And uh, in verse 7, it says, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then the prophet says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. In other words, God has shown us what, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. We need to walk humbly before our God. Uh, so many problems in our homes and in our churches would be resolved if we as believers would walk humbly before our God. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's times as a husband and wife, you get upset with your husband, and you, you might have a, a fight. You know, you say things you shouldn't say. All of us do that. <laughs> and afterwards, I immediately, when I get mad at my husband, I immediately know that I've done wrong. But I try to justify it. <laughs> and I try to think, if he wouldn't provoke me, or if he, would, if he would do things differently, I would respond in a very loving way. <laughs> but then I have to say, God, forgive me. I know I'm wrong. And then I have to go to my husband and apologize. Not, I apologize, please forgive me. You know, even though you provoked me. <laughs> messages in the church and God speaks to our heart and says, wow, I'm not doing this right. We need to be humble. If there's somebody we need to apologize to in the church, we need to do it. We should not hold any grudges against anybody in our church. Our, the body of believers, we should have love for each other and build each other up in the faith. We shouldn't strive to be superior to other believers. Whatever job we do in the church or in our home, we should not expect thanks or gratitude from others. If you teach a class here in the church, Sunday school class or a ladies class or whatever, or you sing in the choir, do it with the right motive, <coughs> humbly before God. And I know that's hard. Uh, I've, I've sung almost all my life with my sisters first and then with my daughters and with my husband, I've sung in churches, and you know it's really hard to get up and not have pride in your heart. It's hard afterwards uh, when people come up and say, oh, that was great, to give God the glory and not yourself. You know, if you've sung in the church, you know how that is. It's so hard for us as sinners to be humble. But if you do those things, do it humbly before God. Sometimes we do good things for the Lord, but with the wrong motives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If God prospers you with a better job or a house, humble yourself before God. Mm -hmm. If you're suffering in any way, try not to complain. Humble yourself before God. Mm -hmm. Try to do all for the glory of God and not for your own glory. If your children love the Lord and are serving him, don't boast. Humble yourself before God. When you're busy, like Martha in the Bible, humble yourself before God. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Where will that exaltation be? In heaven. We don't deserve heaven. And 
and yet yeah. we'll be there one day, all of us together for all eternity, rejoicing in God's goodness to us that we don't deserve. But if Jesus Christ came to this earth and humbled himself, we as believers should always in our minds say, stay humble, stay humble, give God the glory for everything in your life.